Good morning, everybody. It is good to see you all today. I know we did this already, but just do that thing where you turn to your neighbor again. Turn to your neighbor and greet them heartily in the Lord and say, it is good to see you in the house of God. Love is never out of fashion, right? It's never out of vogue. Wow. How many of you enjoyed that rich time in the presence of God? Can I tell you something that's beautiful about these Sunday mornings like this when we have that? It's not being manufactured. It's not being whipped up and built up by leaders or the worship team or a rock concert or lighting and smoke. It's actually very simple devotion. And the beauty of it is that the real worship is coming out of us instead of a few. We're not building a culture of disciples where there are watchers and performers, right? We are a community of disciples who follow Jesus Christ, who worship God in the spirit of God, Paul said in Philippians. We are the true circumcision he says the true changed of heart that worship god in the spirit and do not follow a protocol or watch performers do our worship for us may that never change may we constantly be a people who love god and in the presence of god exalt him and love him while his power rests upon us and transforms us amen praise god So today we are starting a series of four messages where we are going to do a, a look at the book of Galatians and we're going to do what is called a biblical theology versus a systematic theology. A lot of times our preaching is systematic, meaning we start with a topic and we look at several scriptures to explain a subject or a topic that's in the Word of God. Biblical theology is instead of starting with a topic, you start with a text. And so in this case, we're starting with the text of Galatians. And it is good for us to actually take time and do a deep dive into a book of the Bible because it helps fill out our understanding of who Jesus is, what he's doing in the earth today that's very similar to what was going on in the time of Paul's life when he wrote this book. So let me give you a little bit of background about this book. Oddly, this book is written probably within about 20 years of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are more than 2,000 years out from that, or nearly 2,000 years, I guess, if you put him at 30 AD, and so we're, we're almost 2,000 years away. So this is 20 years, and what's interesting to me is that within two decades of the most powerful event in world history, the church of Jesus Christ is already confused, and that churches are being taught perverted teaching that is perverting the gospel and putting men under bondage. 20 years is not very long, and we're already starting to get off the rails, and Paul is having to fight for this newfound faith that's entered the earth through God's power. And so Galatia, if you're wondering where in the world that is, if you could look on a map and sort of look at modern-day Turkey... That is the area called Galatia in the New Testament. Turkey was not a nation yet. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it was a group of people called the Gauls. And so you look at Galatia in two separate planes. There's the ethnocentric group of the Gauls that were really Western Europeans that had come several hundred years later and had territorial land wars. And then about 80 years before the time of Christ, the Romans come and conquer Galatia, and Galatia becomes a Roman province. And so by the time Paul gets to Galatia, it is no longer a band of marauding groups pillaging one another. It has now been conquered by Rome, but as Rome's custom was, they set in governor-style leaders, and they exercised a fair amount, oh, thank you, of, of freedom and liberty to run that part of the world. And so there's the northern part of Galatia and the southern part of Galatia. And I'm already losing you. Stay with me. Okay, you got to have a little Bible history to know what this means. 
So the Galatians or the Gauls were a people very susceptible to any form of new religion that came along. They were uh, very much into having uh, gods that they worshipped and they loved the uh, Olympian gods and Hercules and these kinds of things. And so they were very open to a a God-man and the Son of God coming to redeem the world. There was already a predisposition in them due to their supernatural or superstitious history, I would say. And, and so when Paul comes, they were not so against it that they wouldn't listen. And so they as a culture, while they were susceptible <clears throat> to various forms of religion, it was always coming and going, which is why Paul could go there and bring the gospel on his first missionary journey. And then not very much longer, other people could come and say, no, wait, there's more. He didn't tell you the whole story. There's more we can add to this. And they were willing to listen to it. Also... So you have the whole territory of Galatia, but in the southern area is where the Roman roads were primarily built, of which the Apostle Paul and his team would have worked. And so Paul goes on his first missionary journey in Acts 13 and 14, and one of the primary regions they go through is Galatia, and it's mainly the southern part of Galatia. And if you've ever looked in those chapters and heard of cities like Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derbe, not Antioch and Syria, Antioch at Galatia, those churches being planted are the ones that Paul is writing this letter to. And so what has happened, he and Barnabas have launched out and started planting churches, and he returns home and he finds out that behind him have come other people preaching a different gospel and are seducing the churches away from the gospel that Paul preached, saying that Paul the Apostle was an inferior apostle to the Jerusalem apostles who were really practicing the law of Moses in ways that Paul wasn't, and that he had not told them the full story. He had given them some sort of stunted perversion of the gospel that was inferior to the 12 that walked with Jesus who lived in Jerusalem, who really knew the story. And so they come behind Paul and Galatia, and they say, here's the thing. If you really want to be Abraham's descendant and you really want to be a part of the promises of God made to Abraham, you have to fulfill the law of Moses and then you'll have the real deal. You'll really have the kingdom of God and then you will be truly followers of Jesus when you observe the law or the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, what is we generally refer to as the law. If you observe Torah laws or Mosaic laws regarding circumcision and how you eat your food, then you will truly be God's people. And they were inviting all these people that were Gentiles to circumcision and to table obligations that were handed down to Moses in the first five books of the Bible. And Paul, you can imagine, listens to this and says, what in the world is going on with you? That is not what we brought to you. This is not what we agreed upon. Peter and I We have talked about this. We realize that God has delivered us from the obligations of circumcision and Torah laws. And now all of a sudden you're coming back and putting this load on the Galatian churches who, by the way, before Paul and these guys had ever come and preached the gospel at all, never heard of anything like this in their life. So could you imagine? Well, this week we've heard about Jesus and how by faith through the power of the Spirit we have a relationship with God and God's power is transforming us by knowing Jesus. But wait, there's more. I can also bring out my private parts, take a blade to them, and then after I've recovered from that, I can go and have a meal in a certain way and not eat with certain people and then I'll really be holy. And Paul says, that's crazy to the question he asks, who in the world has bewitched you? Who has seduced you away to a perverted gospel and took you away from the simplicity of knowing Jesus by the power of the Spirit through faith? Does that sound familiar to you? You say, well, I'm not really worried about anyone from the you know, synagogue or something coming over and saying, look, I have a blade handy, and I would like to do some circumcisions to get you really holy. And we have a whole system of dietary requirements and how you eat food. And if you'll observe all that, woo, will you be anointed? How many of you say, I'm not really in fear of that right now, and I'm not concerned that someone's going to come and knock on the door with their blade and their food laws and ask us to succumb to that in order to be holy? However, Galatians is a bigger story than Jew and Gentile. It's the idea that the gospel is received by faith, 
and is empowered through the Holy Ghost in your life in a relationship with Father through Jesus Christ and that there is always something in the earth coming to twist that and pervert it and to add a bunch of stuff to the story that detracts you away from knowing the Lord and starts following some system, some religion, some um, bizarre spirituality that doesn't really have much to do with the Bible but has a lot to do with how people make money and monetize that, uh, expand their brand, and exert their influence over people groups. That's the moral of the story. And so Paul is saying, we have to write a letter to confront this. He is going to do three things in this book of six chapters, written in about 48 AD, 20 years-ish after um, the Lord resurrected and ascended. The first two chapters, he's going to call out the problem in chapter 1. He's going to defend his apostolic ministry in chapter 2. In chapters 3 and 4, he is going to give a theological explanation concerning Abraham and the covenant of Abraham and how that refers to Christ, and we are the inheritors of that. And then in chapters 5 and 6, the third section of the book, he's going to appeal to the Galatians to move off of the bewitching that's happened to them and come back to the power of the gospel, which, by the way, in chapter 5, has the ability to transform your life from nasty deeds of the flesh to the fruit of the Spirit. And circumcision and table laws or religious uh, constructions do not generate a change of heart to make you free in the presence of God. Amen? So that's the problem. So it is to these churches in the southern part of Galatia along the Roman road track that they went on their first generation of uh, ministry and missionary work that he writes this letter. So he starts off in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle, and he's going to get right into it. Not sent from men through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. In other words, I am a man of God, and I was not raised up by some religious institution wielding a circumcision knife and having a list of requirements to hand down to you. He goes, God called me to this message. God called me to this kingdom, and God anointed me and sent me out into the earth. I was not sent out to represent an institution or to establish one. Why is that important? At some point, there has to be a root within us that came from God and not something we inherited from dogma. Hallelujah. Let me say that again. At some point in our lives, God has to have spoken to us and ministered to us and created something in us by his word and by his power rather than our first attempt to understand coming from institutions. Something that I'm very strong on here is that you would all know God, that we are teachers and preachers helping you have what you already have. And if you don't have it yet, we're going to preach the gospel so you can come to him and then have it. We're not a few who have it handing down a dogma. All of us are called to live in the presence of God and the power of God and to have something from the Lord ourselves. And guess what? I trust God enough that God is able to do that without me having to put structures and rigorous doctrine on people to hold them intact. Wait, could that really be true? That the Holy Spirit himself sent from heaven is able to call men and women to himself, reveal Christ to them, have them become born again of the Spirit, and have a relationship with God where they can read the Word of God, walk out their faith. Of course, there will be learning and adjustments along the way, but that God could somehow create a church out of men and women who know God like that without rigorous uh, religious institution and liturgy and these kinds of things being a controlling force to keep us in line with what we don't have in our heart or to control what we have in our heart but never allow us to break into the power of God to have it for ourselves. We are not paid professionals handing out a religion. We are mothers and fathers trying to bring the gospel to the world in a very simple authenticity. How many of you could say amen to that? All right. So he says, and all the brethren with me. In other words, I'm not alone in this. And then he he skips his usual 
greetings of grace and peace coming to you. And he, he, though he says it in, three, in, in verse 3, in the other books, he has a long introduction, which was very common to Greek form at that time, of saying all these things he feels about them and that he's praying for. He jumps right into it. Instead of going into a long discussion of introduction, of warmth, he gets right into it. He says, to the churches of Galatia, I'm getting into it. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be the glory forever. Amen. So he gets into it there. He goes, look, the reason we have this is not because a system has come to us. He says, simply the Lord Jesus gave himself for our sins and we are rescued from sin and its power over us and have a relationship with the Father and that's it. He goes on to say in verse 6, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel which is really not another, only that there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So the way that sounds right there is it's written in, in this English translation. It looks like he's saying it's another gospel and it's okay, but, but it has a distortion in it. Actually, in the Greek, he's saying something much stronger. He says it's not a gospel at all. Yeah. Hello? He says, look at it that way. He says, I am amazed. Everyone say Amazed that you are quickly deserting him. And that word, that word deserting here means like turncoat. In other words, I was once a part of this group, but now I joined the opposing group. Now I've joined the opposition, not just another group. I've joined the opposers. So it's like I was on one side of a battle line, but I ditched my uniform and ran across the battle line, and I joined the other army we were once fighting, and now I'm a part of them, and I'm fighting you. That's what's going on here. He goes, it's not a gospel at all. He goes, and it's some who are disturbing you and uh, distorting the gospel. Listen to what he says in verse 8. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, listen to this statement. He is to be accursed, strong. As we have said before, so I say now again, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you've received, he is to be accursed. He says, so am I seeking the favor of man or of God? Am I still striving to please men? If I were trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of God. So in other words, he says, am I a man pleaser? Or am I playing magic games with God's power in order to sort of seduce you into something? He goes, let them be accursed. Now, these are very strong words. Accursed, meaning thrust away from God into darkness. All right. Another gospel a distorted gospel takes us away from the simple devotion and faith in Jesus Christ and adds a ton of stuff to it that we start interacting with the form and worshiping the form and become justified by our ability to perform said form, whether it be heavily doctrinally and uh, legalistic or super charismatic and wild and crazy. These become a danger to the things of God. Now, my own history in this, this has been a thorn in my side for 40 years. And it started when I came to the Lord. Now, you got to realize, I had had very little church history by the time I got born again. I mean, my mom had gotten saved a few years before I had. And I had, you know, been to some services and tried to repent, but didn't really have faith to because God had not really done that work in my heart yet, but he was drawing me. And so I was, you know, you've heard me tell my testimony. I was very lost. I grew up, you know, probably for the first, uh, you know, years of my teenage life all the way till the time I conversion. I was a heavy pot smoker, drinker, carouser, played in rock bands. I was not just a nice boy who needed an improvement. I was dark and running the streets of this town doing awful things. It's, it's a miracle I never went to jail. But what was amazing to me is that when I came to Jesus, how all of a sudden all my friends were Christians and wanted me to go to their church. And you know what the first logical question I had was? If your church was so great, how come you're so dark? 
And then as I began to listen to them tell me about their church, I began to realize, oh, that's why. Because you go to an institution of religion that doesn't have power in it to change your heart, and you have justified yourself on the basis of performing what that church asks of you rather than having through the power of the Holy Spirit a faith in Jesus Christ that connects you to eternal things. Now, that is not always a reason to indict a church. It just could be those people were off. But the thing was is that there was a lot of them, and everyone all of a sudden wanted me to go to their church. And I remember thinking, I am not going to go do that. I am already being tempted to trade in the freedom that I've been given in God. you got to realize, for a guy like me, for the first time in my life, to be able to say no to sin and deceitful things and evil through the power of God was a big transformation. I mean, like, it was like one day something flipped over and a switch went on inside. It was a thing called faith. And I felt the power of the Holy Ghost come upon my life. And when sin presented it my, to, my, to me and presented itself to draw me in, I was able to look at it and say, I am not going to do that today. I'm going to run from this temptation because the power of God is giving me strength to do it. And I had not even heard much preaching yet. I hadn't read the whole Bible yet. I didn't know all the things church did. All I knew is that the power of the Holy Ghost through Jesus Christ lived in my heart. And I didn't even know what all the deeds of the flesh were. And I did not know what all the fruits of the Spirit were. All I knew is that God was saying, you can be different right now. Praise God. Yeah. And it was interesting when I started getting around church how I quickly ran into systems, programs, and plans. Now, that isn't always bad. I mean, we need to have a measure of order to know when we're showing up at stuff, who's going to be teaching, what we're going to be teaching. This is not against organization. But the problem was I found people interacting with the organization and the system and finding a justification from being in that while they lived dirty, awful lives and justified both. This is what Paul didn't like. He's like, look, if you go down the road of starting to accept systems of religion and start working out of legalistic practices in order to know God, then Christ died needlessly because that doesn't require the power of God. And so the gospel was being perverted and it was under threat. And so in the remaining moments, I just want to talk about a few other things here on how the gospel gets perverted. Before we say that, I just want to mention here that Paul did not just live in his own revelation and have no validation from others. He says in verse 11 that he went up to Jerusalem a few times to be received by these people. He starts off into a description there saying that he was the best of this religious thing. He was the best Pharisee. He was the best Judaizer. He was the best person who went around requiring the law of Moses, punishing people who didn't do that and trying to kill off the church. He says, after God spoke to him and revealed himself to him in verse 18, he says that he went up to see the apostles and become acquainted with them. And when they listened to his gospel, they validated it and they extended him to him, the right hand of fellowship. And they basically, he becomes joined to this movement. And they validate his ministry. He receives theirs. And so he's not a loose cannon. Why is this important? Because we're not just saying any Yahoo can come up with some version of the gospel and go promote it. At some point, it needs to come into the body of Christ and be listened to by other people and submitted somewhere. What's interesting is that the people that the heretics had come after Paul were using the Jerusalem apostles, the experts on the law, to seduce Galatia away from simplicity in Christ to returning to the law of Moses. Paul says, oh, by the way, those guys that are supposed to be the experts converting you all this? Yeah, I know them already, and they're not doing that. They're validating my message, not sending it away. So he's giving a defense of why he can say this. All of us need a body of people around us who listen to what we're saying, where we can submit our gospel. It can be heard and validated through the mouths of others and not just from our own perspective. Yeah? The thing that discouraged me as a young man is that 
I tried going to churches to cement my gospel because I didn't have a religious pedigree. All I had was a revelation of God. And I read the word of God, and what it taught me was that if I could know the Father through Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Ghost would give me a transformed life, and that this little thing called love would take over everything, and that through love, God would fulfill his will without me having to manufacture one. And you would think that must have been a foreign language because I would go meet with preachers, I would go meet with church leaders, and it was almost like they'd never heard of such a thing. Oh, no, no, we have a program and a system to plug you into, and if you'll do this, you'll be that. I remember one time a good friend of mine, God bless him, he's a man of God, he said, Tommy, he goes, you need to become a platform man. I said, what in the world is that? I don't see that in the Bible anywhere. A platform man. You should be a platform man. I don't know what that is. I said, there's no five-fold ministry grace called platform man. There's no office in the Bible called platform man. He goes, well, this is the way this works. He, goes, you, he says, you go to this church and you sign on as a youth pastor, see? And then after you do that for a while, you go to another church and you become an associate pastor, you see. And then after a while, you take on your own church. And then when that's grown, a bigger church hires you. Then you take on that church and so on. And he goes, and before you know it, you'll be at a certain age of life where you have climbed a ladder and you will have arrived at a place of financial prosperity and name recognition and you will truly be a platform man. And, you know, he fully meant that and had lived that and was a brilliant platform man. Probably one of the best I've ever known. And sometimes, oddly, you can actually have a pretty pure heart and live in some of that if it's all you ever knew. And he had a pure heart. But I remember listening to that thinking, yeah, uh, that ain't going to work for me. That's not going to work. Here's why that's not going to work. Because I'm going to get involved in that. At some point, I'm going to say, what in the world is that? And I'm going to point something out that's not of God, whether it's the homosexual worship leader or the pastor in adultery or the false doctrine or the push for money that's way beyond the will of God. I'm going to start banging on some doors. And all of a sudden, all that blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord will transform to by what authority do you do these things? And this is not going to work. Right? The simplicity of the gospel is what God is after all the time. And things getting in the way of that, he is not interested in. Now, I want to just, before we go, give you four points. How I understand it, at least, the gospel's being perverted in this day and age. They're not very hard to understand. The first one I've already been talking about is dead religion. I just want to say this. Any religious group that downplays the role of the Holy Spirit and the power of God and says that isn't necessary and that isn't really what we're after here, stay away from it. I remember talking to these preachers one day, and they said, well, the Holy Spirit can show up if he wants to, and if he does, we won't be offended. But uh, we're not going to look for that or invite that. But if for some odd reason he sovereignly pops up, we're not going to shut him down. But it's not something we really want or are interested in because it will get in the way of what we're doing. Well, you're shocked by that? How many churches you think in this town on Sunday morning would be just like that? In this nation. How do I know? <laughs> I've been led out the door. But anyway, it's not about me. In other words, Paul's saying, who bewitched you in chapter 3? What spell have you come under that now following religion has replaced life in the spirit by faith? Remember, I'm going to keep saying that. This is the goal of Galatians, that you have a relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins so that the power of the Holy Spirit could come live in you and that you would become a part of all that God promised regardless of religious pedigree and regardless of religious dogma 
that now holds you in some kind of form that makes you not rely upon God. Amen? Something that has shocked me for years is that the idea that if I do physical actions other than the ones God commanded like baptism and water and communion, if I do physical actions and I follow through with physical stuff and I do something with my body in a meeting other than what's given by free will, by lifting my hands or lifting my voice, but something that's required of me to follow something that I would know God through doing physical acts or following some sort of system, saying something several times or going to this and then to this to make me know God. I think you get the point. Moving away from life in the spirit where God sorts the issues of our flesh through the promise of faith, when that's no longer valued, we have left the gospel and joined something else. The second one is the money angle. When ministries and preachers talk about money as a focus and how giving to them causes God to bless you, I can tell you right now there's a perversion at work. Hello? How many of you know that's true? Can you put uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 up there? If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. This guy does not miss words. He says these people are accursed in Galatians. He says Galatians is under a witchcraft spell. Now he's saying, if you disagree with this, you're conceited and understand nothing, but has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind and depraved of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment, for we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. Whenever you're in a place and there are strong calls for offerings all the time, and you hear the preachers talking about wealth and a celebrity lifestyle, and about how if you knew God, you would have a celebrity lifestyle too. We would all have new cars, preferably German-made cars or Italian-made cars, none of that American Japanese trash. I mean, it has to be, you know, like Mercedes and Bentley and these kinds of things, right? And if, you, if your watch is not, you know, an Apple watch, but it's like, a, you know, a Rolex or something, or, you know, your clothes are Armani and Boss, and these, it's like at some point we have left the simplicity of the gospel and made it a purpose of gain. Can I tell you something? Following Jesus Christ is not about personal wealth gain and us becoming influential multimillionaires in the West. Whenever preachers get up and say, God has told me that, one, that 10 of you are going to give $1,000 or 5 of you are going to give 500 and there's prophetic ministry for money, we have left the gospel and we have joined something else. The money angle is a very slippery temptation because for us to have all this, building and all this stuff and for some sort of salary to be paid and the lights to be turned on and to have to replace gear sometimes. It all takes finances. But here's what this has to become. We have to trust God for that. And the main person I ask for offerings is from the Lord. And it's usually about what one I'm going to give. <laughs> right? So that I live by faith. Can I tell you something? If I did not, was not one of the strongest givers in this church, I couldn't preach this message. Because I have to live this message. We have to live it. Meaning, well, it's what you do if you're a preacher. No, it's what you do if you're a Christian. You're obedient to God with the first fruit of your wealth. And anyone in here that feels called by God to be a leader in any level, measure, or form, God is going to deal with that in the beginning so that a love for money is not in the root of your heart. Right? The money angle. Man, there's a lot of be money to be made off uh, dumb Christians. Dare I say it? Dumb Christians. 
Lovely people, well-meaning people, dumb. Yes, if I buy that holy anointing oil from Israel for $500, I too will be healed. And now here's the thing. Sometimes God actually heals people not because they bought $500 healing oil from Israel, but because they actually believed God. And even though that was, might, have, might have been a misled act of stewardship, there was faith in it that God saw beyond that. So when someone says, look, we sold $500 vials of healing oil and some people got healed, it's not because they bought the healing oil. It's because God was merciful and their faith broke through. Perverting the gospel is what this text is about, is about today. Who has bewitched you? Chapter 3 says, right? Who has perverted you? Why are you so quickly running away from what God gave you to something else? So the money angle. The next one is social political movements. Woo, this is a big one. Everyone say social political movements. Now, you don't maybe know this, but in the last 100-ish years, 120 years of Pentecostal history in America, you'd be shocked to find out how much of the healing revival and the prophets and all these apostles and all these things that got going in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s were connected to social movements. Because those social movements sort of aligned themselves with this God and country sort of Christianity and came to preachers and said, if you will sign on to our social movement, our social movement will give you money and permission to operate in our territory. Right? So, for example, if you were to go to the 1930s and the 1920s, especially the 30s, to a Depression-era time, and you were in the South, the Ku Klux Klan would pay for a tent to be erected and would give you money and invite their community to your meetings to give you offerings if you would endorse some of their social movement. And so did the Masonic Temple. You say, no, that didn't happen. Oh, yes, it did. People in those days were willing to embrace very dark social platforms in order to get the approval of the community those platforms had power in so that they could build big ministries and make big money. Did you know that? This is dark. You say, we wouldn't do that today. Wouldn't we, though? It's interesting how the tide has shifted. So now if you support BLM and LGBTQ and all these other things, you get a free pass from the society as a redemption for your joining to whatever you might have been in the past. <laughs> like... Well, because those people were in the Klan and the Masonic Temple and all these, you know, very anti-Semitic. And, yeah. and so it's interesting how whatever generation you lives in, a social movement, whether it be liberal or Republican, right, or conservative, like we're not going to put MAGA signs out in the yard, just like we're not going to put a rainbow flag out in the yard, because both of them are a terrible ditch and a social platform that has nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to go bomb an abortion clinic. And I'm not going to seek to burn them down and beat the people up going in there. Do I wish they would not go in there? I do, and I pray earnestly, but I'm not going to go fight them claiming my cause from God or stand in front of a movie theater disavowing a film with my sign. I'm not going to chase down the social moment of the hour and make my stand for political causes like that. <clears throat> the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to cut through all that nonsense when it's lived and preached well and to pull people out of lies and deception and that social movements get put in perspective, right? How many churches have fallen to this in the last 10 years? Whole denominations have succumbed to woke ideology. The United Methodist Church just had a big cave-in where the majority of them embraced this social movement where now LGBT pastors can perform same-sex marriages and everyone was so happy except God. 
say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about there is always a pull in the earth. Or whether I go join a, a conservative movement and build my platform off of what everything we're against. Now, there might be some principles better on the conservative side than the liberal side for sure. However, I can't identify with either one as the face of the church and the face of my faith and the face of what God is doing here. It's a seduction that will take us out of the things of God. Am I being clear here yet? The last one is the other end of the spectrum of the dead religion is hyper-spiritualism. Now we're really going to meddle. It's a bewitchment. It's, it's a bewitching thing. Whenever there's a ministry or a church who showcases on purpose spiritual activity to perform for crowds, and so that what you're going to is to go watch some spiritual thing performed to wow an audience, we have left the simplicity of the gospel, and we are now in a completely different ditch. So, there's these people on YouTube now that love to have demonized people rolling around on the floor manifesting while they play with the demon until the audience has had enough, and then they drive the demon out, and everyone is so happy. To build your ministry off that, that is a conceit and a dark mind. What about the dignity of these people? What would you do if that was your wife or husband? Building a platform off what we can perform puts us in a place where we have to keep ratcheting the performance up. Higher and higher because last week's trick gets old. And we need a new one. And we need a new one, and we need a new one, and it gets darker and darker and weirder and weirder until at some point you have to have glory dust falling down from the rafters, which oftentimes is just stuff put into the HVAC and blowing out of the vents. <laughs> you guys okay? We have to have angel feathers. I never saw Jesus or the apostles have an angel feather. We have to keep having weirder and more bizarre things go on to keep the crowd coming. In the 1940s, there was this guy named William Branham. He had a boy that levitated. And the crowds would go to the tent meetings to watch the levitating boy, which was just a pony trick, sideshow. It wasn't real. How many of you know that wasn't real? He had another little boy who could take out a plastic eye and supposedly see through the plastic eye for the crowd and read their mail. And he went like on tour with this sideshow. It got weirder and weirder so that people kept coming and giving money. You know that that has never left the world. Come see our bizarre ministry. Can I tell you where the supernatural is supposed to be? It's supposed to be a lifestyle where the helper, the Holy Ghost, comes to our life. And that our main mission is not bigger offerings, bigger buildings, and bigger shows. The main mission is the kingdom of God going out into the earth with power to heal people and to call them to Christ and to deliver them from the things in this earth that have plagued them through sin and demonic power working on them. It's the love of God redeeming a society back to himself. And that it should be everyday life and very normal to us. Right. Are we against casting out devils? No, not at all. We do that all the time. Why do you do that, Tom? Because they should not be here. Do you lay hands on the sick and do you see them healed? Often we do. I wish everyone we prayed for did. But not everyone does, but many do. Why do we see that? Because God has a plan for their life. And right now it isn't this. They need to get on with the mandate of the kingdom of God, and this physical limitation is shutting them down. In order to get back to work, we need a deliverance and a God encounter that picks us up and puts us back in the field. The mission, yeah, the mission is always the kingdom and not our ministry. The mission is always the kingdom and not our platform. 
I was talking to my good friend Paul Kidd, who's in Kenya today, and we were having this phone call, and he's on the phone with a man named Bob Mumford, a very famous Bible teacher. We're having like this three-way dialogue here, and we're talking about how God is raising up men and women that are going to walk in the power of the Spirit to confront which is false so that something authentic could come into the earth and that the kingdom of God would have power and that it would be normal people living normal lives with a supernatural ability. Instead of chasing the spectacular, they live in the supernatural, and God is doing miracle after miracle without fanfare or billboards to collect big money to create a doctrine and an institution. That simply the Spirit of God is moving city after city and bringing transformation to people's lives through love, by believing in Jesus Christ by faith. And that's it. The bewitching of the gospel never has gone away. And I'm going to say this to you. If you're pure in heart, she's excited about this message. God bless her. You know that doesn't bother me at all, right? I'm going on my 11th, 12th grandchild, so we're, we're well acquainted. The point of all this that Galatians is making is a very preeminent verse that I'd like to refer to for a moment. In fact, I'm just going to read this whole portion of the chapter as we get ready to close this. He says in chapter 2, verse 15, he's arguing with Peter who has succumbed to dietary food table laws and separated from the Gentiles. He calls him out publicly and he says, We are Jews by nature, meaning we are born that way, and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even when we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Let me just translate that for you. We have relationship with God at a heart level by faith, and in that place of faith, a thing called love works. Galatians 5, 6, faith works through love. And then the power of the Holy Spirit lives in that place of faith. Romans 5 says the Holy Spirit is shed abroad in our hearts, the love of God. And when I have a relationship with Jesus by faith, and I know him intimately because I believe in him, his power lives in my heart. And everything that God wanted me to be that the law described, God produces by his power. Instead of memorizing 613 laws and making sure I'm performing them. How about abandon that and worship God and let God live inside of you in such a way where the law writer becomes the heart abider. And lives inside of you and produces the nature of God by faith and transforms you without you needing religious structure to say, see, I've clicked the boxes, I'm right with God. Because we're very good at creating just the right form of boxes to tick that we manage that make us feel good about ourselves while keeping the things we don't want to get rid of. Yeah? How many of you feel like you've heard this kind of preaching out of me before? Yeah. Because I feel like my whole ministry has been in a defense for a pure gospel. And I feel like I have fought the religious charismatic craziness, dead religion, money, people that are just pushing for offerings. I, I have been in meetings in my, in my middle 20s. I am not kidding. I was in a mega church in Fresno. Man, and they were working this offering and coming up with all kinds of slogans and all kinds of things to do and all kinds of angles to sell this offering. The whole service in front of thousands of people was about selling this offering to get these people to give money. And they were expecting a certain number and they had hired this Madison Avenue group to come in that had all these tricks and said, well, if you can't give 10% of your tithe, give 5%. And if you can't give five, give two. And by doing all that, we'll sort of arrive at this big financial number where we can do the things we want to do. And there was a heavy push coming on the congregation from actually a a good friend of mine. And I remember, I'll never forget it. I was such an uncool person to bring to church. (laughs) So during the preaching, see how Harold's relaxed like that right there? 
yeah, this is the way the congregation was. All right, here's what I did. I laid across the whole pew, and I wept and wept and wept under the power of God for what I was witnessing. <laughs> Imagine on the front row a young guy fully stretched out on the pew, shaking and weeping under the power of God as he's watching this money push take place and how grieved the Holy Spirit was. You ever done that? <laughs> Have you ever gone to church and laid on the front row and cried your guts out because God's Spirit was grieving the moment? And your life became the lightning rod of the spiritual battle going on in the heavens while these people were milking and offering and God was grieving at the lying and the misrepresentation of his word. <laughs> I'll never forget that moment. And finally, after a while, my friend who was up there and really pushing this offering with great zeal looked down at me and I looked up at him with tears running down my face, and I was just, my eyes were all red, and I was so grieved, and all the life ran out of his face when he looked at me, because he knew, he knew in that moment something was wrong, dead wrong. This is so sensitive. The perversion of the gospel in the onset of the church was everything to the apostles, and they knew if it got off even a little bit, it would be dead in a few years. So Paul does not mince words, bewitched, seduced, mutilate. Would those people mutilate themselves? They're asking you to, to carve on their bodies. What in the world happened to you? And these guys that are so important who walked on water, yeah, let me tell you about them. They're confused. And I had to confront them to their face. That's how confused they are. In other words, Paul was such a heat-seeking missile, this must remain pure, this must remain clear, this must remain right. And we have to do everything we can at all costs to remain loyal to God and true in our heart and faith. I mean, we could say amen. And so at this church, do we claim to have mastered this? No. Paul says we've not become perfect yet. But forgetting what lies behind, we press on towards the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Whatever we do here is going to be given freely and by faith in love. Whatever supernatural power is acted upon here, and there's going to be a lot of it, it's going to be because God's doing something in his kingdom and in the world and transforming us to go be ambassadors of that, not for a show. And if we're going to have a culture of discipleship, it's not going to be laden with a bunch of laws and requirements, but it's going to be simple truth lived out in the presence of God, loving one another, and anything that violates that is a problem. And we're not going to be bewitched. God willing. I said God willing. You know why it's great to lay at an altar and weep at an altar? As God told my mom years ago, a broken and humble heart won't be deceived. How many of you say, Lord, I don't want to be deceived? Right? So can I encourage you to do something? Take this message and run it as a filter for all the YouTube stuff you watch. Take this message as a filter for all the Facebook posts that come across your feed. Because algorithms target target groups. And so if you're a Christian and you like Christian things, the algorithm knows to give you Christian-ish stuff or social platform stuff or money-driven stuff because social media is not about informing you. It's about making, making money. I'm always amazed. There's all these preachers on there that love to condemn other ministries while they're monetizing their channel and doing the same thing. <laughs> right? I want more likes. Subscribe to my channel. Now, I'm going to talk about why preacher so-and-so is so bad, and I'm going to name them by name and convince all of you how, how terrible they are, but subscribe and hit like. The hypocrisy of that is astounding to me. Now I'm ranting, but <laughs> what am I saying here? I'm saying take, take 
this and let it become a filter for how you live your life. You know what? Bread of life can create its own religion <laughs> and its own laws and its own systems if we're not careful. And you can have them too. If I got up and I read 10 verses and I did these things, I'm pure before God. While all day long I have all kinds of evil racing through my heart. No, 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 no. 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 Lord, in humility, I live in brokenness before you. And let there be a pure gospel of Jesus Christ living in my heart by faith through the power of the Spirit. And let me put no reliance on doing works to make me right. The works will come out of my faith. They will not replace my faith. Yeah. Don, thank you. So there's three more messages coming. The next one will be Danny, and he's going to talk about the theological argument of the laws given and how they were a tutor because of sin, and that Abraham was given the promise of God before the law came because it was received by faith and not by doing works. And then I'm going to come back and talk about the deeds of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. And then Doug Craigbaum will talk about the appeal of bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. And that's going to be the next three weeks. How many of you would say Galatians is important to look at right now? Amen? All right, can we all stand to our feet here before we go? Father, today, to the best that we can, we have wrestled with a very wonderful book of the New Testament, written early on in Paul's apostolic career in the world, but potent with a resolve that was so fierce that he was willing to offend anybody that had to be offended in order to keep the gospel clear. He said to the most important people in Christendom at that time, he didn't remain in subjection to them even one hour under their delusion of all of this in order that the gospel and the freedom of it will remain available to us. Lord, let us have a ferocity, not that condemns others and likes to beat up other people, but a devotion in our heart that says, Lord, I want to remain clear and pure and reduce this down to the most simple place of faith and love. I don't have to show off. I don't have to take people's money and run a scam. I don't have to follow a bunch of rules. I simply have to love you and want to love you. And in that, love others. And that we will be justified by faith through grace all the things we want to be different in our lives, your power will produce them through conviction and godly sorrow. And let there be miracles and power. Let people be delivered of demon spirits. Let physical bodies be healed. Let words of knowledge come forth that unlock things in front of us and give us the lift to get into our next day. Let dreams and visions come that are full of power that speak to us about what you're doing so our obedience can be complete. Send us the vision of the Macedonian man. Send us a revelation that says there's many people in this city and to not be afraid like you did the apostle. Lord, come and speak to us about our life. Speak to us like you did Ananias to go after the most unruly person that seemed to come into the kingdom of God and to take the scales off their eyes through prayer. Father, send us into the world with anointing and power that's real and doesn't draw attention to ourselves and give us vainglory. Let the truth live in us, Lord, where we can have a filter of watching lies come down the road and we go, nope, nope, yes, nope. And not that we become the judge of everyone else, but we judge our own selves and live in a freedom that you give. Lord, I thank you that Galatians says it was for freedom that Christ set us free and that we don't return to a yoke of slavery, a bondage of religion, whatever form it comes in. Lord, I pray that the peace of God, as Paul prayed, the grace and peace would be ours. The power of the Holy Ghost.